Hey everyone, and thanks again for joining us here at the Foundry Church. My name is Justin Colleen, and I'm the worship director here. We are so glad that you're here to see all that God is doing in and through his church right now. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, make sure you go and like our Facebook page. There you will find additional content as well as the teachings that you see here on our YouTube channel. And speaking of, if you haven't subscribed for that yet, make sure you do that right now while you're here. Uh, with that said, let's go to our summer series right now, Judah, the Kingdom Chronicles. My name's David. I was a shepherd boy, the youngest of seven. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah as leader, and from the tribe of Judah, he chose my family. And from my father's sons, he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. declared to me through the prophet. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him. So now, I charge you in the sight of all Israel, and of the assembly of the Lord and in the hearing of our God. Be careful to follow all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and pass it on as in inheritance to your descendants forever. And I instructed Solomon my son and pled to those who came after to acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And these are the sons of David, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amon, Josiah. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promise so that your name will be great forever. King Hezekiah, I have seen the hand of God for many years. God has been faithful to us, even when we were surrounded by our enemies, by people who hated our God. The Lord our God is faithful to us. But I'm not surprised. The nations cling to a God that is made of wood and metal. Their people form their God with their own hands. Our Lord God is ruler over all the earth. Oh, the many miracles that I have seen. Praise be to the God of our father, David.
Well, hey, Foundry Church, welcome as we gather around King Hezekiah. And at last, I mean, this is like a breath of fresh air. This is like a drink of cold water when you are stranded in the desert. Hezekiah is a good king. And if you've been with us this summer, it's been a long, dry, hot summer of brokenness and immorality when you look at the kings of Judah. But Hezekiah is one that will stand like an oasis among the sands. And I'm so excited to dive in with you and really take a look at King Hezekiah, look at his life and realize that even this great monarch, he wasn't perfect. He had things going on in his life and choices he made that weren't the best, but his heart was towards God. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use um, a bit of a a lever we have in the foundry um, because because we recognize in giving people like huge job descriptions, things get lost. So we actually, with our job descriptions, with our leadership model, every month we have a top three, uh, three things we're really dealing with. Every job description, every employee has their top three things. I think mine are teaching, um, vision and kind of working out kind of where things are going and leadership development. And that's kind of my job description. How I live into that is going to be seen through those three things. So we really work hard at the Foundry to do our top three and do them well. You can attend to three things well, but when you populate something with all these to-do lists, sometimes you get lost. So today, looking at the life of Hezekiah, here's what I recognized. There is so much to learn from this king that we could spend months studying the biblical narrative of Hezekiah, studying some of the ways he, he informed and transformed the way we think of God in the Old Testament. We could do so much around Hezekiah and really spend months there, but we don't have months unless you want to stay here for months. But you don't. You're like, seriously, you got 28 more minutes. Jump on it, right? So um, here's the reality. We're going to hit three takeaways. I'm going to punch three takeaways today on this ticket, and we're going to go ahead and move into it and really work with the top three takeaways from the life and the rule of Hezekiah. There's a lot about him in Scripture, and hopefully you were in devotions this week and really kind of seeing the story. It'll make more sense if you've been in those devotions, and I encourage you, if you you haven't done them, grab a devotion book on your way out, and it'll help you be in the Word of God, but also be more prepared when you come in on Sundays so or Mondays or Tuesdays, whenever you worship at the Foundry. So here we go. We're going to jump in to 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 to 7. So here's what it said. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses has, had made. So, so we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but he broke into pieces this bronze snake. So hold on to that little nugget um, because it's just an important thing to look at. Uh, for up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it like it was an idol, and it was called Nehush. Oh, you can't move ahead that quick because now I can't pronounce it. I'm going phonetically. Um, ne- oh, Nehushtan was the name of this bronze snake. Now, let's look at it. In Numbers chapter 21, we see a scripture where um, it would read really weird in isolation. What it would say is, what it says is that um, every time the people of Israel were bitten by a snake. Moses had crafted this bronze snake and held it up, and when you looked at it, you would live. The other people were dying who didn't see it. This was because Israel was unfaithful, and God sent a plague of snakes. And so God told Moses, fashion this bronze snake, like, you know, cast it, pour the hot metal in, mold it, and hold it up so that the people won't die. Since the time of the Exodus, they have been treating this bronze snake as an idol. I mean, do you see how they made an idol that quick out of something God used to save them, out of something that was blessing and a healing of God? They turned into an idol. And I would say this, just right out of the gates, we need to be very careful that we worship God. We need to be very careful that we worship God, that we don't worship his healing of our physical bodies, that we don't worship the blessings he pours into our life, that we don't worship at the the opportunities or the abundance we have. We worship God alone. 
We don't take the moments we've had with them and make them into our God because that's what Israel had done. We'll jump back into the text. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was none like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after him. He held fast to the Lord. He did not stop following him. He kept the commands that the Lord had given to Moses. And the Lord was with him. He was successful in everything he undertook. Everything he put his hand to turned out to be successful in the reign of Hezekiah. He was amazing. He was amazing. Like as a king goes, he's this bright oasis, gleaming with life, green, green growth, you know, like the palm trees, those springs of water surrounded by a sea of sand. He is this great king. But remember this, he's the son of Ahaz. Ahaz, the most despotic and evil king up to this point in Judah's history, is his father. And you you really don't get any worse than who Ahaz was. Hezekiah reminds us of one thing that I want to be our first kind of takeaway. He reminds us that we are not destined to repeat the sins of our parents. We are not destined to repeat the sins of our parents. And for some of us, that was like a tidal wave of relief that just washed over us. It tells me this, you don't have to be the victim of or the participant in abuse. You're not bound to maybe what's happened in your past. You don't have to be abandoned or abandon a family. You don't have to rage against the world in every possible way and be a constant victim or perpetrator against the world. You're not bound to their fate. You don't have to flounder without purpose or passion for what God made you to be in this life. You're not bound to their fate. Now, our parents aren't all those bad things, but I can tell you this, each one of us has that moment where we do something and we move like our parents and we're like, no, no. Anybody else, you guys? Yeah, like my dad goes downstairs a certain way and one time I went down the stairs and I was like, nope, and I like literally went backwards back up and came down differently because I'm like, I'm not not gonna look like my dad. Now, I love Chief, he's a great guy, but I am not, don't know. Right? I'm not going to be like my dad. Here's the thing. When, you are, when you're saying, when I say these different things that goes on, go on in families, we know that behind closed doors there is brokenness. Every family has its issues. From the most well put together, happy looking family, they fight. Right? There's yelling in that home too. Or if it's not yelling, there's passive aggressive things that go on. Here's the reality. What I'm trying to drive out, you are not bound to their fate. He was the son of Ahaz. What do we know Ahaz did with his sons last week? He fed them to Molech, a pagan Canaanite god. To be a son of Ahaz really wasn't the greatest benefit. But when we look at this, it gives us hope. It gives us hope. Our one, number one first takeaway in this is really that we, thankfully, you're not destined to repeat their mistakes. If you live a life that is spiritually alive in Christ, you're not destined to make those mistakes. And Hezekiah's life teaches us that if we're faithful to God and we pursue God, not only is he faithful to us, but our lives do have a different impact, purpose, and passion. So if you're here and that's a word of freedom to you, praise God. You're not bound to make those same mistakes. The second thing we know is this. Before before we dive into the text, um, what I would like to do is is take a minute and explain like historically what's going on. Because historically, we're in a point in Israel where there are some big kingdoms. You've got Assyria, who's off to kind of the, the east there. Babylon is on the rise. And we know that they are squeezing in on, um, on, on Jerusalem, Israel, Judea, all this stuff. They are really squeezing in. And this king named Sennacherib, was king of Assyria, which was the biggest, most dominant kingdom for about seven centuries through the ancient world. Assyria was really on the scene and running the show. Sennacherib was king, and he had Jerusalem surrounded, completely surrounded. They were besieging Jerusalem, which tells you this. Not only was Jerusalem surrounded, it was the last island left. Everything else, all the fortified cities, the northern tribes of Israel had been swallowed up by the armies of Assyria. And King Sennacherib has Hezekiah, in his own words, pinned like a bird in a cage. 
He's pinned like a bird in a cage, and Hezekiah is trapped in his own city, and he's in a whole lot of trouble. And, and here's the words we get from Sennacherib. He's writing back to the people of Israel, the court of Hezekiah, or the people of Jerusalem, the court of Hezekiah, and these people. This is what he says. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern. Remember, they are bottled up in Jerusalem. There's no farmland in that city. They are bottled up. This would have been very desirable things. Until I come and take you to a land like your own. A land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey. Choose life and not death. These are the words of Sennacherib. Don't listen to Hezekiah. He's misleading you when he says, the Lord will deliver us. Now, just catch these words. Has the God of any nation delivered his, hand, his land from the hand of king, the kings of Assyria? Has any of the other gods saved them? With the implication, why would you be any different? Where are the gods of of, um, Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of um, Separavim and Hena and Eva? Have they rescued Samaria, the northern ten tribes of Israel, from my hand? Indeed, they hadn't. Samaria was not only being besieged, but the people were being taken off in exile. Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? He's saying, I'm better than the gods. How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? How is your God going to be any different? But the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded them this. And I love this. Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, went to Hezekiah with their clothes torn, which is a sign of lament. They're like, oh, it's the worst. It's, we're, we're ruined. And they come in clothes torn and told him what the field commander had told them from the king. Oh, that is devastating news. Can you imagine getting that and having delivered to deliver that word to the king? And they're like, Here, here's what he said. He's telling us God's not even going to save us. God's not going to do anything. How did he- Hezekiah handle the threat? How did Hezekiah handle the threat? Because I'll tell you this. His father had set a precedent for him. Ahaz had made a deal with who? Sennacherib's dad, Tiglath-Pileser. Remember last week we talked about it? Tiglath-Pileser came in and laid waste to Aram and the northern tribes who besieged Jerusalem. So, so his dad had shown him how to make deals, how to make political deals with people. And Tiglath-Pileser had been the deal his dad made. And now what would Hezekiah do? Let me ask you this. How would you have handled this threat? What would you have done if this threat was delivered to your doorstep? How would you respond? Would you start looking for deals? I remember during um, the early days of World War II, there were tons of British politicians trying to sue for peace with Hitler because they knew he could invade them. And there was one lion left in Parliament, Winston Churchill, who was like, we will fight on the beaches. We will fight on the landing grounds. We will fight in the streets. We will never surrender. Like it makes me want to speak with a British accent when I hear those words because he said no. And just like, like out of that kind of tradition of great people, Hezekiah stands as a monarch among them because while he was surrounded, he handled the threat with God in focus, not himself. He handled the threat knowing, well, there was great punishment to be had for him. And the reality for you and I is we've been threatened in this life, haven't we? Like, have you ever had somebody threaten you with something? I was a sky cap, which um, I don't know if you've ever been to an airport where they have sky caps, but they carry your bags and then you give them a tip. My granddad uh, owned National Car Rental, so I got to sky cap in the airport when I was 12. And you carry bag for all the skier, bags for the skiers in winter. And if Aspen and Telluride were snowed in, they had to come through Grand Junction. And those people had money to tip little sky caps who looked helpless. And we tried to look a little. It was like, uh, like from Oliver Twist, please, sir, can I have some more? Like we pitiful, wretched bunch. 
and we would carry their bags, and it was awesome. There was this kid named Brett who was uh, two or three grades older than me, and he had hit that certain special growth age between 11 and 14, and he was like six foot one. He had a full beard, and he was 13, right? He was just a beast of a human, and it's so funny because that was he was done growing after that, and one day I eclipsed him. I'm like, hey, Brett, but he threatened me one day because I got um, – I didn't know, but they were celebrities, and I got celebrities and, and hauled their bags. They gave me a $20 bill, which in 1984 was, or 85, that, that was a lot of money. I was like, yeah, all day, I'm eating Twix tonight, you know, because I was a kid. That's what I was hungry for. And um, Brett came up to me, pulled me aside, and he told me, you take another one of my customers, and I'm going to break your legs. And I was like, because at that age, my legs were super breakable. They were like that big around, right? It was horrifying. I was like, oh, I'm going to get my legs broke because now I can't back down, right? I was terrified. I never got my legs broken by Brett. But I'll tell you this. The response to the threat was frightening. I was scared to go get my next customer. I saw him, and I'd like make sure he gets him. i like, hey, would you like to have your bags? You know, like I was terrified. It terrified me. So let's look at how Hezekiah, in a moment of terror, handled the threat. It says this in 2 Kings 19, 14 to 19. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and he read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and he took it and he spread it out. He spread it out on the temple floor before the Lord and Hezekiah prayed, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, which are just beyond the curtain where he prays. You alone are God of the kingdoms of the earth, including that kingdom Sennacherib rules. You, God, are the king of kings. You're the king of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent, not to the people of God, but to ridicule the living God. He's saying this threat isn't against me. This is your fight. He lays, I just think, I love Hezekiah for this very moment in his life. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Here's takeaway number two. Takeaway number two is this. Lay it before the Lord. Your problems cannot be worse than that of Hezekiah. There is not a bloodthirsty Assyrian monarch who has laid waste to everything around you, who's got his sights fixed purely on you and your population and is going to lay waste to you. Here's the deal. You can lay it before the Lord. You must lay it before God. Don't hold on to it. So let me ask, what crisis are you facing? What little thing or big thing is going on in your life What threat is coming your way that seems too big or impossible for you to handle? I know we have these. It can be as simple as a flat tire or as big as as the loss of a loved one. It can be massive things that we're facing. God, I don't know how to handle the grief or the loss or the pain or a broken marriage or, or some kind of loss, disease, or crisis. It's not impossible with God. Hezekiah teaches us that if we lay it before the Lord, and we place it in his hands. We not only submit to the authority of our heavenly father, we submit to his healing touch. And we submit to his power to give us peace through the storm or completely transform the storm. And here's the reality. We have to lay it before God time and time again. You can do this in big things and small things, but you have to lay it before the Lord. For, for me personally, for Erica and I in our life, we had a moment where we had to lay before the Lord a piece of paper, a couple pieces of paper that were a calling to a church in Oak Harbor, Washington that would have relieved us from a very tense situation where my job was was more in jeopardy than in confidence, where our reality was falling apart around us, and we laid before the Lord this call that came to another church, and God said, refuse it. And we had to talk and say, are we okay if we have to sell our house and move in with your parents if I lose my job? Because we refuse this call. 
It was terrifying. I'll never forget after I hung the phone up from saying no to that church, I laid on a bed at Camp Geneva and I sobbed like I had had a bad dream. It was horrible. It was, it was the moment where I, I, I've said this, where I cut the lifeline and all I had left to do was fall into the hands of God or into my own punishment. It was, it was traumatic, but it was my moment where I could lay before God everything and say, Did you, I think you called me to this. I'm going to stay. I'm staying at the foundry. Whether it makes it or not, I'm staying at the foundry. I think that week, like 21 people came. I'm like, it's not going to make it, right? It just didn't feel like it was going to happen. So it was a really big thing. But I do know this. It's not easy. It's not easy laying it before the Lord. And whether you have great anxieties or these little things that eat you alive, the reality is um, we are called to lay it all before the Lord, whether we're surrounded by Sennacherib or whether we are just being haunted by our own things. I have a, a wonderful experience that I have with Erica uh, where she, she shared with me that 10 plus years ago, she was really struggling with some anxieties. And she realized that it was God who walked her through it in big legitimate things and very small things. God walked her through it and she had to lay it down before the Lord. And she said, I didn't really realize I was struggling with anxiety. I just knew that I had to give it to God. I had to give it to him. I had to give it over to him. These things where maybe you wake up in the morning and you've got so much going that the day is already full, you're overwhelmed, and you haven't even put your feet on the deck yet. You're overwhelmed with it. There's no way you can get to the whole task list. You're already failing before you start, and the anxiety builds. And Erica told me she lay it before the Lord. Just this, the overwhelming sense of, like, I can't do it. I can't get to it all. Even down to some of the crazy little things. The, the little, like, I, for me, like, some of the funny things, the quirky things I know about my wife that she doesn't like to do, and she'd say, like, you know, maybe returning something. She'd be driving there, and she'd be thinking of the thousands of ways that it would go wrong. And she said, even in those circumstances, I had to lay it before the Lord because it wanted to paralyze me. So whether it was feeling like I can't even start my day because I'm already not going to get to it all, or this little return lay it before the Lord. And she was talking to me about this. I wrote it down. It was give it to God. Give, she would give it proactively and does even to this day with many things a day. Gives it to God and asks God to go ahead of her. Go ahead of me. Make a way, no matter how narrow or wide, make a path for me to follow you. You, God, cut a swath. Go ahead of me. She invited God into it by giving it to him. And then she invites God to open her ears and her eyes to see where he's at work. It sounds overly simplistic, but I think God knows that we are but dust. He knows we're sheep who quickly go astray. And the calling for us is to give it to God, to lay it before God, knowing his goodness, knowing his faithfulness, and knowing that our great anxieties and our little anxieties are held in his hand if we would but hand it over. I invite you in this this second takeaway, lay it before God. I know how crippling anxiety, depression, heartache, grief, loss can be. We know that personally. And we also know the great God who holds it in his hands and holds it with us. He walks us through our crisis. He holds us through our crisis because he loves us. Do what Hezekiah did. Let God fight your battles. Let God make a way. When God's making the way, things go differently. So we now get to kind of see how Hezekiah had a faithful life because he laid before God the great accusation of a high king, Sennacherib, who was going to destroy him. Destroy him. It wasn't easy, but he shows us that God was always the only option. I want to capture that. Hezekiah's reign shows us that God was always the only option. We have enough comfort and stuff in this nation, in this community, to find tons of other options. But Hezekiah's life tells us one thing. God was always the only option. God was always the only way we were going to get through this. So, here's what we know. Hezekiah, going into point three, his life wasn't easy. 
He actually faced a life and death crisis in 2 Kings chapter 20. It actually says this, in those days, Hezekiah became ill to the point of death. And the prophet Isaiah came to him and said, this is what the Lord said, put your house in order because you're going to die and you're not going to recover. (laughs) Thanks for coming by, pastor, right? I mean, what a terrible visit. But here's what Hezekiah did, and I love this. He didn't get mad. He didn't shake his fist at God. Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and wholeheartedly been in devotion and have done what was good in your eyes. And then he wept bitterly before the prophet Isaiah got past the middle court. God said, turn around. I got something else to tell Isaiah or uh, Hezekiah. He goes back in and he says to Hezekiah, I'm going to give you 15 more years. I'm going to give you 15 more years. And he gives Hezekiah a reprieve. And he recovers. So there's this great recovery, this miracle of God. He was on his deathbed. Cue up this little thing. Well, let's call it, Hezekiah gets the hiccups spiritually. Here, has a little bit of a moment. Let's see if you can catch it too. At that time, Marduk uh, Baladan said, son of uh, Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. Hezekiah received the envoys, showed them all that was in the storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, the fine olive oil, his armory, and everything found among the treasures. There was nothing in his palace, nor in all his kingdom, that Hezekiah didn't show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said, This is an interesting moment. What did those men say, and where did they come from? When your mom or dad ask you that question, what would you just do? And you're like, nothing? No, what would you just do? Right? It's that moment. From a distant land, Hezekiah said. They came from, did they come, they came from Babylon. The prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? What were the things they saw in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There's nothing among my treasures that I didn't show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace, all that is your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. When we see that, it's just devastating. But then there's finally this moment where it really becomes clear, the pain of the punishment. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, will be born to you and will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Eunuchs are, uh, well, we're not going to go into that right now because that's a side road, but they will be made um, infertile and unable to carry on your line, and they will serve in the courts of Babylon. When When we see this text, we can just ask the question, Why did Hezekiah get in trouble? So Hezekiah's trouble really begins where he reveals everything that's in his house. But but why was he rebuked for showing the treasure? Why was he rebuked for showing them all that he had, the great wealth and the things of his family tradition? Here's the thing. We can look in the book of 2 Chronicles and get a really good look at what's going on. 2 Chronicles tells us this story with a little bit more of a nuance. Here's what it says. But when envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon, who Babylon was an up-and-coming power and would eventually conquer the Assyrians, when they came from Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign that had occurred in the land. So what was the miraculous sign? Was it Hezekiah's doing or was it God's? God by his word, had healed Hezekiah. They came to hear about that. It says that God left him. God departed from Hezekiah to test him and to know everything that was in his heart. (coughs) What was in his heart? It was all that he had stored up, all that he had done. We see this moment where God had delivered him, he had helped him, he had blessed him, and he had become, he being Hezekiah, had become just a little bit proud. Hey, tell us about this sign and wonder that God did in your life. Have you seen my Maserati? Tell us about God's faithfulness. 
Did you hear about, you know, our new place that we just got? Right? They're coming to hear. He has a chance as king to tell them about God's goodness, his faithfulness, his power, his deliverance. He has this moment to tell them and to speak of God's goodness and his faithfulness. And what he does is he shows them how much stuff he has, how great his family is. And he misses his moment to point to God. God had done the miracle. People were in awe of it and in awe of Hezekiah. And in his pride, he shared in the glory only God gets. And that is a moment of conviction for us because thankfully, he repented. He was confronted by Isaiah. He repents of this behavior and he remained faithful to God all of his days. But there is still this final lesson, the third thing we can learn. Stay alert. Stay alert. When you are healed, of some brokenness, when you are rescued, when God blesses you, when you get past any crisis you face on any level, when you get past it, don't relax, stay alert, because indeed God did deliver Hezekiah from Sennacherib. Jerusalem didn't fall to Assyria. Sennacherib fled, having lost 185,000 men in one night because the angel of the Lord swept through their camp. There's historical record of him leaving with his tail between his legs. And the dead were stacked up because God intervened. And the reality is after the crisis, he started looking at all his stuff. He got confident and he wasn't alert. You tend to relax when the crisis passes and that's when we're most dangerous. Erica and I went shooting one time. It was our first time shooting a Glock. It was awesome. It was cute as could be and I had fun with it and it was so cool. And the first time she, she held it, she's like, man, it's so heavy, you know? I was like, yeah, isn't it great? It's the smell of cordite in the morning, I love that. And uh, she takes it and she, she points it down range, she's like, whack! And she shoots it and it was loud and, the, and it ejects the casing, the little nine millimeter casing, comes out, bink, hits the sidewall and flies over and dunk, hits her in the forehead. And she's like, oh, and it turns out she, I was like, it's fine, it's a casing. And she's like, oh, it was great. And she's like waving the gun. And I'm like, stop pointing it at me because the nerves were over. But she's just like, oh, man, did you see me shooting? I'm like, ah, you don't do that. You keep it down range, right? It threw me off. I wasn't that wild. You just kind of turn around like, oh, man. And I'm like, mm, you know, because. Like, my dad would still put me over his knee today for doing that. Like, that was a huge no-no, but she relaxed. And she's like, she turned around to talk about it. The reality is you can be at your most dangerous when the crisis has passed. If you don't stay alert, when we relax, we are dangerous to the witness of the faith. I encourage you, my friends, today, stay alert. Stay alert. Because the God who pulled you out of your crisis is still with you in the same measure on your best day. Stay alert because your witness is seen in the crisis and beyond it. I think uh, Abraham Lincoln said it so well. Any man can handle adversity or most any man can handle adversity. You want to test a man's character? Give him success. See what he does when he relaxes and is king of his world. Here's the reality for you, for me, for Hezekiah, for everybody who's gone through the crisis and made it out on the other side. We know the lessons of not staying alert. I encourage you, church, stay in the word of God. Trust in God on the good days and the bad days. It is in all these seasons that God works. We must stay alert. Pray with me. God, thank you for your church and the calling to be alert and attentive to what you're doing. Bless your church as we go and we engage in your mission to this world. Thank you for the opportunity that we get to share in being a living, teaching voice of the gospel in our day and age. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us for today's message. If you are looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's message, make sure that you click the link below in the description right now, and that'll take you to our weekly devotion page. Weekly devotions are a very important part to our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry Church. We really hope that God spoke to you in a powerful way today, and we cannot wait to see you again next week.